Give Jesus a round of applause in this place. Somebody say, I love you, Jesus. Man, he's good. Well, guys, we get to introduce our panel today. Who's excited for the, the uh, Marriage Challenge panel today? Come on, let me hear from you. Get excited. We're going to hear from some experts today, and I think our first uh, couple here is, should be well known to us. That is our senior pastors, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa Garcia. Would you welcome them? They have been married more than 33 years, and we're going to get to hear 32, 33, 33. So let's, get, let's give them one more round of applause as they come. Come on now. We also have, we also have uh, some people you just got to meet for the first time today, but that's Pastor Resty and Michelle Collins. Would you welcome the Collins? They have been married for 22 or 23 years. 23 years, man, amazing. We'll get to hear from them. And of course, another well-known couple to us, a dear friend of mine, Pastor Christian and Pastor Yesenia De La Rosa. Been married. A little over two years, getting close to three. We're getting there. So welcome our panel, guys. We are so excited everybody's here. Uh, Vanessa and I will be hosting today. What we're gonna do, guys, is we're gonna get some questions that you previously submitted, and we're also gonna get some questions from the audience today. So you'll see Pastor Armando and Ruben, uh, two of our greatest servants, walking through, and if you have a question, you'll flag them down. We'll be able to give those to our panel in just a few minutes. But Pastor, this is an exciting season for us. I know everybody hopefully got a door hanger as you came in. It's got all these services coming up for Easter, but Pastor, Tell us about Easter. Why is this such an amazing time of year for us? Great, how you guys doing? So glad to see you here. Easter is a really holy moment or separated moment for us, especially as a church, because there's a lot of people that will come to church if you invite them. And what we need to do is do everything we can to invite them. There's a few things that we're doing God does the saving, God transforms lives. We do the possible, God does the impossible. There's a few things that we're gonna be doing. You have a, a bookmarker that you can put in your Bible and, and, and it's, 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 it has a commitment on there, but you can write some names back here. And when I was talking to my staff today, I was telling them, I think this is basically how it happens and God is saying, they're on my mind, but I can't reach them until they get on your mind. Right. He goes, I'm trying to get them on your mind. If I could get them on your mind, I could reach them. And what we're gonna do is say, God, they are on our, on, our, on our minds. And we're gonna write it down and then go in the foyer and write their names on the board. And we're believing as we're writing their names on the board, there's a book, there's a book in heaven <clears throat> called the Lamb's Book of Life and mm -hmm. everyone's name that's written in that book enters heaven. But I think by faith, we could write their names there, yeah. and then we're believing the next step is they'll come forward to give their lives to Jesus on Easter, Amen. and their names are written up there. Yeah. We're gonna do our part, and then also, um, next Sunday night, say with me, next Sunday night. Next Sunday night. We're, we're even gonna do one step further, and we could just apply our faith, faith without action that produces no results. This is what we could do, is bring a picture of your friends, your, your son, your daughter, your, your, your cousin, your uncle, your, whoever it is, bring, their, bring a picture, and then we're gonna have a time in the service on Sunday night where you're gonna bring those pictures up to the front, and it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be kinda like this. By faith, they're, walk, they're taking the walk to the altar. We're gonna do it a week earlier, and we're, by faith, we're gonna bring them forward, and then we're gonna pray for them. How many believe that's a great idea? So we're gonna be doing that also we're gonna do all we can, and then we'll let God do the rest. Yeah. These services, are, the, our Easter services are gonna be amazing. Um, Good Friday, it's gonna start, and we have a presentation that's gonna go through the foyer. It's a living, it's, it's like you're immersed in the Passion Week, you're immersed in the crucifixion of Christ, mm -hmm. and also we're gonna have a service in here. You do not wanna miss it. Uh, I, I'm talking to the drama team, and they're saying, it's, the, it's, it's amazing, we should probably do it on Sunday as well. We're probably not doing it on Sunday, the only opportunity is gonna get is on, on Friday. Friday, so you wanna yeah. be here on Good Friday, it starts at six o'clock. But this, and then on Sunday morning, we have our, our sunrise service. It's at six o'clock in the morning, 1, 6 p.m. Friday, and 6 a.m. Sunday morning. This is what I do know. 
Our 6 a.m. sunrise service is the greatest service all year long. There's such a peace that's in that service you won't experience in any other service. We'll probably have around 1,500 people show up to that service and worship. This is what start. It starts in the dark, and while we're worshiping, we see the sunrise. Then we get a word from God. It's it's like nothing you've ever experienced. You want to be there 6 a.m. Then we're gonna have our 9 o'clock service, our 11 o'clock service, and our 1:30 Spanish service. And I'll conclude our our Easter services or resurrection services. All I'm saying, let's celebrate and let's attend all of them that we can. And let's do this together because this is a way to worship the Lord. How many believe we're worshiping the Lord together? So write their names out there, do your part. And also we're doing one more thing. We're bringing a resurrection offering as, as an act of worship to the Lord. But I would even say this, this is a time we're united, the Spirit of God is moving. Why not bring an offering by faith and ask God to resurrect something that you see, man, I need a miracle here. That's I'm believing for something supernatural to happen yeah. on the day we're celebrating your resurrection. So you could bring an offering by faith and also as an act of worship on this big day that we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Awesome. awesome. Love you guys. Pastor, I know you said on Saturday, this Saturday, we're going to come together as a church and we're going to yeah. go out. And you were saying this, there's, there's kind, of, kind of cool things happening on that Saturday. You were talking about uh, just some churches that were coming together at that time. Yeah, we're, so we're going we're gonna to meet here next Saturday. And there's a huge outreach in California that we, I didn't know about, but I found out this week. And they're renting 10 stadiums. Um, and they're believing and they're going to have 10 different areas that they're hidden. Uh, they're hidden with, evan with evangelism, with the gospel, and they're believing that it's going to begin a revival in California. Wow. How awesome that we, we are, are doing an outreach on that same exact day. Yeah. All we're saying is let's get with the flow of what God's already de prophetically declaring yeah. over our, our, our state and come together for a couple hours on Saturday. We're going to pray, we're going to worship, get some instructions, and then we're going to hang out, uh, send some door hangers out there. We got 20,000 door hangers. This is what we're believing. We're going to hit 20,000 homes. How many oh, believe we could yeah. do that? We're going to do our part, and we'll let God do the rest, but we're going to be here. It's just going to be for a couple hours. That's it. But let's do all we can, and then God will do what we can't. Right on. Awesome. So as we get ready to jump into these questions, Pastor, I know that you really, the Lord gave you a, a verse that has some incredible, important skills for communication. We, talk, we started last week talking about communication. I know this will really answer a lot of the questions that we have today, but would you share that verse and some of the skills that we're going to yeah, talk about Yeah, before I share that verse, I want to just give the definition of what communication is. And communication means to give, share, or interchange thoughts informations and feelings by speaking and writing. It also means to connect, interact, to join. So the purpose of communicating is to join, interact, draw closer to each other. Right. The purpose of communication is in to argue and fight. So the definition says it's, it's to share or interchange thoughts, informations, or feelings. Mm. That means as we're talking, we're exchanging ideas or information or letting each other know what we feel. Communication isn't a one-sided road. It's a two-sided road. I'm receiving and I'm giving. If you're only giving, you're not communicating. Uh, it's an exchange of ideas. So now, there's a scripture in the Bible that shows us the three parts of communication or the three skills that we must develop to be effective communicators. Let's take a look at that scripture. In James 1.19 and Amplified, it says, Understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone, say with me, everyone. Everyone. Who is everyone? That's every one of us. Be quick to hear. Be careful and thoughtful listener. So the first part of communication is listening. Um, until you've mastered the art or the skill of listening, you'll never be a great communicator. That means to listen, to understand. There's something I, I, I said, I've said before, but you have not earned the right to speak 
until you've understood what's been communicated to you first. So good communication is not you thinking what you want to say. Good communication starts first with listening and understanding what they're saying and what they're feeling. That's good. What they're saying and what they're what? Feeling. And, and that's why I've heard the saying that that's why God gave you two ears and one mouth so you can listen twice as much as you speak. And some of us talk twice as much as we listen. And no wonder we are not effective communicators. I have, I have literally seen this. I am doing, I'm doing a counseling session and the wife's pouring her heart out or the husband pouring his heart out and they're just speaking and I'm like, I'm taking notes because I'm a good listener. And then I'll say, did you hear what they said? And they say, what? I go, see, there's the problem. You're not even listening. You haven't even tuned in to listen. But look what the scripture says. And it says, slow to speak. This is the second part of communication. The first part is listening. The second part of communication is speaking. And we need to learn how to speak. Screaming is not speaking. I'm speaking without listening, and you're just, I just can't wait till they shut up so I can say what I need to say. It's not good communication. One of the things we need to do is think before we speak. Uh, I have a rule that I, that I came up with, and this is the rule. Wait three seconds before you speak. And this is what I've learned in life, that the devil... And our bad ideas speak for the first three seconds. And after that, the Holy Spirit begins to speak. Some of us are so quick to speak, you're just throwing out ideas out there. And when you're saying things that you wish you could take back, this is what I'm telling you. Wait three seconds before you respond and say, Holy Spirit, help me to say the right thing. And you, this is what's going to happen. Don't be surprised. God's going to begin to tell you, this is how you should say it. So it's not just saying what you want to say. Is saying it in a way that they'll receive it. So don't say, well, I, I'm just going to tell the truth. And if they don't like it, that's their problem. That's not good communication. Right. A good communicator says, how can I say that this in a way that I'm not offending them, in a way that they can receive it? And until you thought that out, don't say nothing. Because you're going to get yourself in trouble and start a fight instead of communicate. Okay, so the last thing is, it says, it says, slow to speak, a speaker of carefully chosen words, and slow to anger, patient, reflective, forgiven, for the resentful, deep-seated anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God, that standard of behavior which he requires from us. The second part, or the third part of communication, and we must develop a strong skill at, is being emotionally have some emotional self-control. That means you should not be speaking if you're reacting in anger. So that means any communication that you're speaking in anger is not communication at all. That means you're being driven. All, they, all they're saying is your attitude is so loud I can't even hear what you're saying. We need to now get self-control. That means you're going to have to be good at forgiving. For, let it go. Stop taking things personal. Stop jumping to conclusions, reading things in the conversation. I'm not going to do that. Let me hear you. Now, I know, I know, and you know when you've heard what they've said and understood it, when you can repeat it. If you cannot repeat it, you didn't hear it. So what should be happening is like this. It's say, honey, I heard you. This is what I think you're saying. You're saying that when I don't call you, when I leave work and I'm gone for hours, it makes you feel neglected, unimportant, and, 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 and then you start wondering where I'm at, and I'm causing you a lot of stress. I'm sorry for that, and I'm gonna correct that. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna call you when I, get, if I'm gonna be late, I'm gonna be going somewhere else after work, I'm gonna call you or text you and let you know. Is that, is that basically what you're saying, baby? She goes, that's what I'm saying. I go, okay, great. That's communication. 
Now you have the right to say something else because you've understood what they said. You guys understand that? And I know, man, Pastor, that sounds so mature. That's exactly what we're trying to develop, some maturity. That's not me. I know. That's why we need to grow. You guys understand that? I, I, don't, I don't feel that. I know. You're feeling your anger. You're upset. All these other things. But that's not communication. So we need to get our emotions under control. Screaming and being hot-tempered, all it does is leads to fights. It does not lead to communication. Screaming at one another is not communication. It is fighting. So we got that? Three skills, listening to understand. Understand what they're saying and understand their feelings. Two, speaking. Think before you speak. Wait three seconds. Have some emotional self-control. If you're angry, have a meeting with yourself before you have a meeting with anybody else. Get your attitude in check, and then you can proceed forward. Now, you as a believer can have self-control because one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. You want to say something, honey? I was just going to say that. Oh, okay. That Praise the Lord. Self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit, and we all have it. We just need to activate it. That's good. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get ready to jump into the question. You guys ready for these questions? All right. These How about the audience? Are you guys ready for some questions? All right. All right. These questions came from you. So we're going to start off with this question. How do you forgive your partner after an argument? So I know you were touching a little bit on not being led by emotions, but this is how do you forgive your partner after an argument? You know, one, one of the things is you have to really recognize that there is uh, there's a problem, there's an issue, right? A lot of times what we do is we have an argument, we have a problem, we have an issue, and then we just try to try to move on from there. So both parties really need to understand that we have a problem, and in the moment, there needs to be healing, and healing, there's something that doctors do when they, they, they have bedside manner. So when a, when a doctor comes to you and he's trying to give you a, a diagnosis or he's trying to give you a prognosis or whatever he's doing, he comes quietly. He comes humbly. He comes to you in a way that is not offensive, and he also comes in a way whereby, as Pastor Marco was just talking about, you can be heard and receive him. And so forgiveness is, a, is a, a place where you have to turn your heart posture and trust God in the moment that I'm not going to be slapped in the face or I'm not going to be turned back from trying to forgive somebody. How many of you know it's really hard to forgive? Yeah. Come on, if we're honest in the building, it's yeah. difficult to forgive somebody that's done you wrong. Right. But when you look at Jesus, who is the author and the finisher, of your faith, it no longer becomes hard because he gives you what you need in your heart to be able to connect with their issue. And then he takes that to the place where now you can join your heart with your mind so you can wait on the manifestation. In other words, I may not see it yet, but my heart is ready for it, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, how do you forgive after an argument? I would also say too, maybe, um, maybe I'm, I want to address something before that, and I want to address how it got to that point, because sometimes um, in a relationship, some of the things that happen is like, how come we're always arguing? We're right? always arguing. Everything turns into an argument, and one thing we've we've spoken about in our premarital counseling, which we did with Pastor Mark and Pastor Lisa, and they're amazing, but they told us that unmet expectations are planned disappointments. This is what I mean by that. Anytime there isn't this communication happening and, and we're not verbalizing or communicating in a good manner, as Pastor Resi was saying, to one another, we don't, we don't know the expectations we have for each other. So when those moments arise where an argument's about to flare up, that's actually that, that, that's because we didn't do the homework of communication in the, in the front end. Arguments, sometimes they arise in these things when they could have been solved probably um, days or weeks before that, when there wasn't tension. Communicating about expectations and some things that we wanna see or um, even talking through some things. And by doing that, 
you could be avoiding future landmines of arguments happening later on in the relationship by having that communication on the front end. I'm gonna, oh, Lisa wants to say something. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, Jesus forgave us of so much, and we need to be able to forgive, and we've right. stated that. But I do want to say that when you are in an argument, if it's your spouse or, you know, you're in a relationship and you're arguing, you got to know this, that it's not God that's causing that. The enemy wants to come and separate and divide. And so what I always <clears throat> have to remember is I'm not going to let the enemy win. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come together, no matter how I feel about this, and I'm going to forgive so that there's strength when there's unity. And so we need to come together, stick together, and fight the enemy, not your husband, not your wife. They're not the enemy. So you fight the real enemy, which is the devil. Wow. Okay, let's get this next question. This is, uh, we're going to ask one more of these pre-submitted questions, then we're going to go to our audience for a couple questions. But this is a question from an engaged couple. It says, how do I make my relationship work when our beliefs are different? She's a Catholic and I'm a Christian. So a lot here. How do I make my relationship work when our beliefs are different? Well, the Bible says that you're not supposed to be unequally yoked. So that means, this is very, very important, is that the time to get in agreement is before you get married. You can't ignore that. Because it might be, it might be a little speed bump today. It's going to be a mountain later. So, so now is your time to say, look, we're going to be raising children, and, and we need to be in agreement, most of all, in our faith. Our faith, we have to be in agreement, walking together, worshiping together. And if we cannot get on the same page on this, understand this. If you cannot get on the same page of your faith, in your faith, you do not proceed forward in your marriage. So these are things you got to solve early. You're negotiating in the, in the fiance, boyfriend, girlfriend stage. When you get married, this is how you should get married. With 100% confidence, saying something like this. If he never changes... If she never changes, I'm good. Nothing has to change. I'm marrying you for who you are, not for your potential. So your faith is a big deal because it's your relationship with God. So don't ignore your faith. Are you saying there's something wrong with the Catholic? Are you saying something wrong with Christian? I'm not saying either way. If you're a Catholic, marry a Catholic. If you're a Christian, marry a Christian. Get be in agreement so you guys could have a marriage that you could actually build faith in your children and be in agreement, going to church together, worshiping together. It's the most intimate thing that you could do is serve God together. Wow. Anybody else want to go on that one? That was a pretty thorough answer, I think. So let's go, let's go to our audience. I see Pastor Armando here. Hey, good morning, guys. All right. I'm sitting here with Ty. She's been here at the church seven years. She has five kids. Ty, what's your question? So my question is, um, as a single woman that is raising five kids, four being boys, um, how would I help my boys with hard struggles that they go through that they feel like only a man can help them with? Wow. Really great question. Well, number, number one, I think, I think what's most important is you have the proper perspective by asking the question. Because a mother can't be a father. And so when, we, when you understand that particular point, you've already, you're like light years ahead of everybody. And so um, one of the things that's important is that you find counsel yourself to find out what it is that your sons need. And there are some things that you can give them, and then there are some things that you just can't give them. So when that happens, being a part of a community like this and being a part of a church like the Way World Outreach that have, how many brothers do I have out there? Okay. So now you, there, there were a bunch of hands that were lifted up that could potentially be surrogate fathers for your son. You don't have to worry about doing it all yourself, trying to be the daddy, trying to be the mommy, trying to be everything. The only thing you really need to do is bring them to the house of God that has the ability to be able to surround you, first of all, with your mindset 
so that your mind is not, because I've seen this a lot, where mothers try to become fathers and the boys run. And so being able to surround them with a community of believers just like this that can tap in to be able to talk to them, bring them to youth group, and be, being able to share with them who their heavenly father is. That is bigger than them being a part of somebody who was a deadbeat that left them and said you're not valuable because Jesus sees them as more valuable than any man could ever see in his life. Wow. Can, can I touch on that? Just from, from your son's perspective, um, my, my mom was a single mom growing up with four kids. Um, my mom dealt with, um, I mean, she, she tried her best being a mom, but even she dealt with addiction, um, alcoholic abuse. We live in bad neighborhoods in LA. And growing up as a young boy, really all I wanted was a dad. That's all I wanted. So at that time, I didn't know who to look to, but I was looking to somebody. So your boys are looking at some man right now, some man figure as their father, as their model. For me as a young kid, I thought it was gonna be these, this gang member. They always hang around our house. I was looking at these guys, and then it was this. But there came a time where my mom and, and my aunt, they, they really, they brought me in, and they brought me to this church. So I was 13 or 14 years old. I was angry inside, I didn't know why. I dealt with so much rejection inside, I didn't know why. But when I came to this church, my parents and my family, they finally came to this point where um, you have no choice now. You're gonna go to church. You're gonna go to the youth group. I don't wanna go, I wanna sit with you. I receive more from the adults. No, you're going to the youth group. They would tell me these things. You're gonna get involved. So they really, the best thing my mom did for me is she didn't give me a choice, but to have the right role model as a father. That was this man right here. He poured into me. He saw the potential ahead of me. And so, and, but it was other pastors and leaders at the time, my youth pastors at the time, and my discipleship group leaders at the time. And the, and, but she, what she did is she pointed me in the right direction so I could model myself after the right people, which is a man of God. That's the right person you want to model your kids after. That's the best thing you yeah, can do. Uh, oh, you want to say something? Um, I just want to say, too, that alongside with, with both of those, those are very practical ways. Keeping God's word the center, that God is our authority, no matter what I say, no matter what, God, the Bible, is the authority that they need in their lives as well. Well, that, that, uh, that is 100% right, is, is God's word says, I'm the father to the fatherless. Yes. So the greatest thing that you could do is worship your father and point them to your father. And, and they say, he's our father. He's our provider. He's our example. We live for him, and we don't compromise. This is how we live. And, and, and boys, they need, they need some absolute authority. And you put the authority of God in your life, because when they see compromise, they, they're, they're going to start wavering. So as a, as a mama with, with, with boys like you got, there is no room for deviation. You said we serve God and what he says goes in our lives. And when they get that kind of conviction, it's all over. Because that's what happened with me. Because I didn't have a spiritual father in our home. But my mom told me, remember, you're a man of God. You belong to God. And you have a calling on your life. And I'm preparing you to do great things. And let's read the word of God together. And, that, and we never miss church. We're always in the word. And it built it built some manliness in me and authority in me that she transferred from the Father in heaven. Not from you, but from the Father in heaven. Wow. I know we hit that from every angle, but that's a really important one. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. So we're going to uh, get another question here from, I think, right Ruben. here. Where are you at? Right can't here, see you. Straight ahead, straight ahead. Straight ahead. Okay. Right, sorry. No, we can't see you, but let's. we can hear you. Go ahead. All right, we're here with... Uh, Stephanie and Maurice, they've been married almost seven years in July and four children. All right. Uh, hello. So uh, my question is for Pastor Marco and Lisa. Uh, I have a desire to serve in discipleship um, alongside my husband, but I also, my heart is um, with the babies in the nursery as well. So my question is, how important um, is it for married couples to serve together in the same ministry? Okay, I think um, 
it's not necessarily that you have to serve in the same exact ministry together. If that happens, I think that's great. But as long as you're serving in ministry, and you, I always say that you're going to be most effective in the thing that you enjoy or the thing that you like to do. You're going to be most effective in that area. The other thing is, is that you guys, you guys are a couple, you're a team, so that means there should be discussion, and then you come to a conclusion, and then you agree, and you proceed forward. Yeah, that's true. So the most important thing, remember this, is your agreement. So if you talk to Maurice and he says, you know, honey, go ahead and serve in children's ministry, um, but can you maybe help me on, 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 on once a month on the ministry, then you do that. Because there is a way for you to help them both. Because your husband, what he wants is support. I don't want to feel like I'm doing this all alone. And I'll tell you, when Lisa supports me in anything that I do, it's like a breath of, I mean, I don't know, a breath of fresh air. That's a nice saying. But it feels like this. I've told her this. When she comes into a room and I'm doing ministry, it feels like the sun, sunshine just came in and it gives the me goosebumps. The wind beneath your wings. No, it's, it's sunshine, baby. That's you're, romantic. Now you're, now That's you're romantic. Too much. That's That's good. 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 Another saying. No, but, uh, but what I would do, first agreement and then see if there's a way to do both because you have a call for those children and that's a passion. And, and as a husband, he's gonna support your passion because you're gonna be super effective there. But don't ignore the, the, the help and the support that you could give your husband. And it might not be the full-time support. You might be going more, you might be 80% over here in the children, 20%, but that 20% to him will mean the world because he's fighting, the, he feels like he's fighting every demon in hell. And when you come in, it's like sunshine. <laughs> On a cloudy day. When wow. It's cold <laughs> we got the doo ops going out here. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Anybody else want to comment on that? All right. Well, let's go to a question from a single. This is a question from a single. Babe, do you want to give us this yeah, question? Yeah, of course. This is going to be, I'm going to go to Pastor Michelle. Right. Um, what advice can you give those who are in their singleness right now? When you are in your season, your exciting season of singleness, you are supposed to be serving. I know you're waiting, but waiting essentially means serving. When we go to the restaurant and we have waiters who wait on us, who wait the tables, what do they do? Serve. They serve. And so you need to be focused on serving your God, your Savior, and it's the best season of your life because you don't have to worry about anybody else. This is your season where you get to be very selfish and focus on yourself and focus on your God and your relationship with him. Because I'm telling you, once you get married, you're now have to, you now have to share your attention, your affection with somebody else. And then when you bring children into that, it just divides and it continues to divide. So it is an exciting thing if you are in a season of singleness. This is your season to serve. We should be seeing you more than anybody else, working in the ministry. Where can you put your hands? The Bible says whatever you find your, put your hands to, uh, do it as unto the Lord because you have the time to do that. You should also be working on personal development. You should also be advancing yourself. If that is education, you should be learning how to cook. You should make sure that you have organizational skills, how to clean. These are all the things. Do you see how busy you need to be in your singleness? These are all the things that you should be working on when you are single. You also want to make your spiritual life a priority. Nothing is more powerful than a wife who prays. This is the time that you are developing your relationship with God. You are in his word. You are praying. You are fasting. You are developing your relationship with God. You are eating the word when it comes out of Pastor Marco's mouth. Every Sunday you are taking notes and then you are going into your week 
practically speaking, and walking that thing out. You are in the most exciting season of your life if you are single. Can we hear it from our singles? Uh, you know, when, when we're talking about single, you want to say something? Go ahead. No, 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 no. Ladies <laughs> okay. first. Okay, I was just going to say, I, we speak to the young adults all the time. How many young adults do we have in the place today? Woo -woo. We share this scripture all the time. It's in Proverbs 18.22, I believe. It says, he who finds a wife finds a treasure. And so just to echo what Pastor Michelle said, be that treasure to be found in this moment. Work on you. You're never going to get your singleness season back. So this is a season, just like she said, to develop, to grow in your relationship with God. Like even just to a practical th uh, ex example, before I was married, I was like, working super late. I was, you know, I was out at my best friend's house all night. I was a full-time student. I was, I was in ministry. I was, I was growing myself. And it's not that I can't do all those things, but it's different now. And so this is a time for you to grow, for you to really develop, for you to go to school, for you to get a job. You don't have to wait until you're married to do all of these things. Start right now. Be that treasure right now and focus on what God is calling you to do in this season. This season isn't a wasted season. It's a season for you guys to do and not to just wait around aimlessly have a have a focus have a goal in this season yeah, very good uh, let, let's let's talk about sickness just a little bit more um paul says it'd be better for you not to get married and and, and the reason he says that scripture because he goes you could go full-time just serving god and, and and singles understand this you gotta get to the point that you lack nothing Stop fantasizing with my husband. When he comes, this is how he's going to look like. I wonder what he's eating right now. <laughs> Could, you know, so so get, get rid of all that because some of you are spending more time in your fantasy life than your reality life. And this is what God is saying. You, you're lacking nothing. Some say with me, I'm lacking nothing. If you're nothing. serving God, you don't need a man, you don't need a woman, because all your passion and all your satisfaction comes from doing what you've been called to do. So don't let the enemy trick you, because I understand this. If you can't be satisfied in the season you're in, you won't be satisfied in the season you're going to. This right. is what I've learned. There's people in it right now that are married and are saying, I wish I was single. And there's people that are single, I wish I was married. <laughs> Learn to get to the point you don't need nothing but God. Right. A guy should come into your life, ladies, and say, just so you know, I don't need no man. I love God. He satisfies me. I'm living a purpose. Now, if someone's going to come in and add to my life, we're good. But not, I don't need a subtraction in my life. I don't need a project in my life. I need someone that's going to make me better. Come on. Same thing with the guys. Get busy serving God. Wow. Okay, before we go back to our I'm audience. Whole. Yeah. Oh, no. Come on, Pastor, preach it. I just like this. I wanted to run around the yeah. stage and stuff, but I got to act right up here. All right. So before we go back to our audience, we're going to get one more question. This is from a dating couple. It says, for those of us that are growing our relationship with God and also dating simultaneously, what questions can we ask our partner to know they are in full alignment with us spiritually and emotionally? That's good. Well, um, I think... One main, main question is, are they really, truly being discipled? And what that means, because the word disciple means this. I know it sounds like a fancy Christianese word, but it's, it's a student that um, learns and obeys the commands of Jesus Christ and devotes their entire life to him. That is the perfect recipe for a great life. You want to talk about, like, is there a secret to life? Yes. It's learning the word and obeying the word. Come so on. if they're being discipled, they'll be able to say that they are. Yeah. Because it's different. You've met people all over the world. Do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. Okay, then, but every other word is a cuss word they're saying, and they're, you know, they're doing this, they're doing that. It's like, do you really believe in God? <laughs> but there's a difference between people that say they believe in God and people that are actually disciples of Jesus. Even the demons believe in God. And you said this last week, or on Wednesday, you said, that's a, that's a demon faith. <laughs> demon faith is, I believe in God, but I ain't living for him. Wow. So, but, so when someone is really being discipled, they'll be able to say it. I go to this church. I, I, go, I serve here. I'm in a discipleship group. 
I'm in Holy Warriors. I, I'm really, I'm studying my word. I spend time with them every day. This is actually a word I got this morning. Scripture that God shared with me. This is a prayer that's on my heart. If that's not their language, then are they really being discipled? Are they growing? Wow. I love that. I have something to say too. If a true godly relationship is going to draw you closer to Christ and not close farther away from him. So if there's any single fruit that's like drawing you away from Christ, then that's a red flag that you got to cut it off. But if you guys are serving together, if you guys are in a discipleship group, if you guys are submitted to leadership and authority, then you're in a safe safe space. But if you're not and it's drawing you away from God, then that's a red flag if you're dating. I would just like to also add another red flag is if they're asking you to date in silence or date in secret. Secrets. You should be able to tell everyone that Very means good. anything to you who you're dating. Very good. And they should not have a problem with that. Dating doesn't mean that you go hide in the corner and in the dark right. because you're protecting your relationship and you're working on your relationship. No, we want you to date in the open Good. so that we can see the progress of God in this relationship and see the fruit of this relationship because essentially you should be dating with a purpose. Everybody that you date, is this someone that God would say I can spend the rest of my life with? and is going to add to my life, not subtract from it. So the first thing to remember is once we're dating, you're gonna meet my mama, my father, my cousin, my brother, my mentors, my pastor. Everybody should know that you all are dating. That way, those people that mean everything to you and that's important to you, they'll be able to see things that maybe you can't see because they say love is blind. Wow. That was a mic drop right there. That's good yeah. right there. That thoroughly answered the question, I believe. So let's go to our audience. Yeah, we are going to go to Ruben. Where's Ruben at? Right there over, he is, over right there. Right over here. I'm here with Aaron and Carrie, and they've been married nearly four years. All right. Hi. How are you guys doing? Um, we have a question for the whole panel. Um, yeah, we'll be married four years in November, and um, I've been lately I've been seeing my wife being attacked by her family a lot. Being, her family's being separated and not wanting to talk to her. And right now, she's really just surrounded by my family. And how do I, how do I be patient with her? How do I um, help her understand that my family won't do the same thing that her family's doing to her right now so she can feel welcomed and safe and loved by a family? Okay. I think the first thing is let's make sure that she becomes emotionally healthy and okay. And that's what I'd be concerned with first before any interaction with anybody else. And I, and I would tell her, baby, I'm with you. And no matter what, we're gonna be, we're gonna be together forever. Yeah. Like, we're, like me and you, we go, we're gonna face the whole world. We're good. I, and, and, like, and Jesus said, and Jesus said it, the Bible says, if I'm for you, who could come against you? And all I'm saying is the whole world might come against you. But as long as you guys are strong, you guys can face the whole world with Jesus Christ. So, so, that, so you're good there. You're good there. Now the next step, I would say, honey, let's forgive them. Let's let it go. We got to practice. Forgive them for they know not what they do. If people knew better, they would do better. They don't know better. I remember when, when um, I grew up, I, I had, my dad died when I was a, a, a kid at six years old. He died in a gunfight. Then my mom remarried my, my stepdad, and, and he wasn't a Christian. And, and because he wasn't a Christian, what was in his heart would come out of his mouth. So you can't expect good to come out of a heart that's, that's not pure. So a lot of that, you were expecting things from people that they can't give us because they need a new heart. The Lord Jesus can give them. You understand that, right? So they're going to give it to you. They're going to give it to you and say, oh, okay, I see what's in their heart. So my dad at the beginning was very negative about me. He never encouraged me. I was a good student in school. I was living for God. And he never one time told me, you know, I'm proud of you. You're doing really good. He would say sometimes the opposite. And, I, and Robert, my, 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 my brother, which is my stepbrother, he would like get away with stuff. I'd get, I'd get a whipping for just looking funny. 
And I'd get a whip and sometimes in front of my friends, you know, from school. And, and it, it was a lot of that. And you're never going to amount to nothing. It was just a lot of that. So my mom told me, he goes, she goes, Marco, first of all, he's not a Christian. So your responsibility is to show him the love of God, forgive him because he doesn't know what he's doing. And I know he's older than you, but you're the example. So what we're saying is take the control away from them and just love them and be the example, forgive them and let them go. And That's as good. far as it comes to you, you're going to bless them. But don't stay there hurt. Because as long as you stay hurt, they're controlling your emotions and then they're messing up your marriage and they're messing up your future relationships because you think everybody's going to be like them. God says, get rid of that. That's them. Forgive them. Bless them. On Mother's Day, send your mama something nice and give her some chocolate candy from C's. Just bless them. Act like they didn't do nothing. Love covers a multitude of sins. Let them go and move on with your life. But the, the greatest revenge that you could have is you be happy and you guys have an enjoyable marriage and they see your success and they see like, what, you're happy? Be happy and enjoy what you do have. You got your husband and you got your husband's family and you got us. Focus hey. on that. Got you got a lot to go for you, baby. Love you. Awesome. Awesome. I'm right behind you, Mike. I got a question All from right. Marissa and Adrian. They're gonna be married three years in May. And welcome back from Kenya. They were on our Kenya mission trip this past week. Awesome. Kenya was awesome. Sorry, side note. Um, so my question is, um, how do you manage wanting to serve, honestly, like everywhere? I feel like I, I'm in a place where I'm just wanting to serve everywhere, jump everywhere, go everywhere. Um, but also need to be rooted and make sure that I have time for my husband, my spouse, and not... Do you be disobedient if my husband says to calm down on my serving? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just tell you this. Num number one, you, ha you have to prioritize the time between you, you and your husband. At the, at the end of the day, ministry is ministry, and then there's ministry to each other. Right? So you can, have, you can have ministry where you're preaching, you're going to Africa, you're going all over the world. Everybody knows who your name is, but you're a private wonder. But then when you go home, you're, 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 a, you're, a, you're a public wonder, but you're a private blunder. Right? So, so, so now you've given every bit of yourself to the church. And we know this because we can give everything to God and to the church. And then you come home and your wife doesn't even know who you are if you don't have a microphone in your hand. Right? So, so put the mic down, put the book down, put the Holy Warriors book down, and go pick up a movie. Okay, go go to Morton's, go to Jack in the Box, wherever you, whatever your 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 fancy is. Michoacana. Yeah, there it is. Come on, come on, right? <laughs> Where's the pastor? Del taco. Del taco. Oh, or no. or go to KFC, whichever one you need. <laughs> All right. So 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 the rea so the reality is. You, you 100% have to prioritize this. And just like you've prioritized Holy Warriors, Daily Growth Book, coming to church, moving forward, if we don't prioritize marriage, guess what? The world will prioritize marriage and your life will prioritize your marriage. Next thing you know, you guys are ripped apart by doing a good thing but not making sure that you spend good time together because all we have on this earth is time which is grace God has given us grace extend grace to your wife and go take her somewhere to your husband and love on her and and the last thing is her personality is her personality use that to your benefit my brother <laughs> yeah, I want to say something also um, when you say that you know you want to serve here and serve there and serve here um, I think that you need to you need to be able to say no to certain things. Even though you may be good at it and you really like it, you have to prioritize those giftings as well. Um, I've been in ministry for years and there's certain things that I like to do, but because that thing may interrupt um, a, a schedule that we have, I will have to say no to that. So you have to be able to say no to certain things. And if God wants that that thing, you know, that you are available in those things, then it'll, it'll open up at another time, at another season. 
So, I, and I think let's re, re, um, to summarize, you got to prioritize, and all that means is schedule. You you don't have a you, you, I don't have a, I'm running out of time. No, you're suffering from time management. There's time for everything underneath the sun that you're supposed to be involved with, and that means there's time. To, there, there's time if you make it for marriage with your husband, there's time for the kids, there's time for your career, there's time for ministry, there's time for all of it. But there's a problem when you, when you have a time management issue and you don't start telling your time what, what you're gonna do, your time tells you what it's gonna do and you're just reacting all over the place. So there's time for everything, prioritize it. Like me and Lisa, we have a Monday, we used to have a Monday night date night, we have a Monday whole day date day. We're older now, so we just take the whole day. <laughs> so what do you do? Whatever. But we spend time, but, but that's, that rarely ever is compromised. And it keeps, I, I know that time I make with Lisa, because I want you to understand this. Your ministry, your ministry is as strong couples as your relationship. So don't, you say, well, well, but I'm a prophet, I'm a preacher. I got thousands of people on Facebook following me. It really doesn't matter. Your marriage is as strong as your relationship. So me and Lisa are very strong. We have a strong ministry because of Monday days. <laughs> right? And we, day, day. And we don't compromise that day. It's me and Lisa time. It's not me and children time. It's me and Lisa time. The kids, can I go with you? No. <laughs> it's just us. And, and that day lets me have freedom to do whatever I want to do in ministry. She doesn't bug me because she's whole, she's complete. We spend time together. She knows that she's a priority. Now I'm free to do whatever I want to do or God wants me to do. We do have an opportunity. According to scripture. To, there you go. <laughs> According to scripture. Let's clarify. We do have an opportunity for every married couple to get involved. We have an intense marriage advance coming up in October, Pastor Marco. Yeah. First week in October, so you can start scheduling, just like Pastor Marco said. Schedule, scheduling prioritize. October, first week in October, marriage advance. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. That was a good plug. That was sneaky, but that Thank was you. good. Thank you. That was a good plug. You can, do, you can find the info on the app. Is that right? On our app. That's correct. Or you can awesome. come out to the foyer and talk to some of our marriage team out there as well. Thank you, guys. God bless. Awesome. How many of you enjoyed this panel? How many got something out of it? Come on, let's give a round of applause to our pastors. And just thank God for the wisdom. So we're going to turn this over to Pastor Christian. Of course, we've got some incredible wisdom, some knowledge, some advice that will change your life. But there's one thing that will change your life more than anything. And this is the most important moment of our service. Christian, if you would. Amen. Man, hasn't this whole marriage challenge just been so incredibly helpful in our relationships? Can we give Pastor Marco and the whole the panel and the staff and everyone that's put any effort into this? Thank you so much. Um, before anyone else leaves today, you know, we'll just quickly review. There's so much that we've learned. We've learned how to communicate. We've learned how to forgive one another. We've learned even about commitment, how to be committed. But all of these things are just good advice when it's done without Jesus. When we have Jesus in our heart, he's a foundation of all of it. Jesus is the power. Jesus is the strength. Jesus is everything we need to follow through on everything we've learned. There's no power or life in any of it without him. Otherwise, it's just, it's just some advice. It's just head knowledge. And I, want to, I want to say this today, that what Jesus is offering you today is something greater than any advice you can get anywhere in the world, and that's a relationship with him. Jesus is offering you today forgiveness of your sin, a new start, a new beginning, some of us feel like we've gone so far off, off course, that there's no hope for us. I have good news for you. Jesus made a way. Jesus made a way for you to be whole, to be healed, for your relationships, to have life. He's made a way. The truth is this, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We've all made mistakes. I don't have to know you personally to know this, that You've sinned, just like me. Everyone on this stage, we've sinned. The Bible says that the wages of our sin is death, which means this.
Because we've sinned, we separate ourselves from God. And not just separated for a moment, but separated for eternity. And it's, it gets, and this is the even worse news. The worst news is that there's no amount of good that we can do to try and make up for even one sin. We can try and go out and be a good person, do good deeds, come to church every week, but all the good things we do will not make up for the sin that we've committed. So where is the hope in this? The hope is that God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for the sin that you and I have committed. It was our sin that put him on the cross. It was our sin that nailed him. It was our sin that put him there, but he did, he will, Jesus willingly gave up his life so that you can have a brand new start. So that now, you don't have to go out and try and be a good person and come back. We could just put our faith in Jesus Christ, repent of our sins, which means turn around for the way we've been living and turn to God today and you can be forgiven. You can have eternal life. You can have a brand new start. This is the love of Jesus Christ. He's offering you forgiveness. He's offering you a new start today. So I wanna ask you this. If today you're saying, I need forgiveness of my sin. I need to be healed from my old ways. I need to repent, I need to turn around, and I wanna give my life to Jesus. And I wanna know that if I were to die today, I wouldn't be separated from God for eternity, but I would be with him forever in heaven. If you're unsure of that, and you wanna know for sure that you have Jesus as your Lord, then when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. You're saying, I want forgiveness of my sin. I want eternal life. When I count to three, one, two, Three, hands all over this room. You're saying, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I see you. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I see you right here. I see you over there. Four, that's five. Anybody else? You're saying, that's me. That's six. I see you. Anybody else? You're saying, that's me. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. You're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want a brand new start. I see you in the back row there. Anybody else? You're saying, that's me. Anybody else? That's me. And this is what I want to do. If you raise your hand right now, I want you to do one more bold thing. Could you stand to your feet right where you are? And we want to clap and we want to applaud you. And we want to say congratulations. Come on, let's clap for those that raise their hand, church. Let's clap, let's clap, let's get excited. Let's all stand to our feet right now in this moment. And if you raise your hand and you're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, what I want you to do is come out of your seat and make your way up here to the front. And we have a prayer team that's up here. They're going to pray with you, and they're going to congratulate you. Come on, church. If, if you raise your hand today, come on forward. We're going to congratulate you right now. And let's clap for all those that came forward today. Come on, this is where we get excited, church. These are souls getting saved right now. some and maybe do this just take a moment if there's someone you're with that maybe wants to go up but they need a little support just check with them and say if you want to go up there I'm willing to go up there with you maybe they need someone maybe they need a friend or somebody check in with the person next to you maybe they're saying you know what I need a little support why don't you come up with me let's go together check in with someone right now but let's give God some praise for all those that came forward right now I want to remind you Tonight, we have our 6 p.m. This is our mass wedding. Around 20 couples have made a decision and a commitment to get married and to do things right before the Lord. And they're going to be up here on the stage. Let's come and support these new couples that are going to be getting married. It's going to be awesome. Also, don't forget, I don't know if we have any more yard signs out there, but we, have, we might have just a few available. Get yours before they go out. For everyone that's up here right now, we just want to say this. We're going to help you. Your next step. It's to get discipled. We have a class that's called Holy Warriors, and we're going to teach you how to walk with God. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you, and they're going to help you take your next step. Are we excited for everyone that made a decision today? Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross and resurrect from the dead so that I can be saved. 
Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my sin. I give you my pain. And I believe in you. I make you the Lord of my life. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Make me a new creation. And I commit my life to you. I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, let's give God praise. Again, don't forget tonight we have 6 p.m. And also uh, that we have service this Wednesday, this Saturday. Someone say Saturday. Saturday is our mass adopt the block. We're going to be here at 9 a.m. We're going to hang thousands of door hangers. If you want to hang door hangers on your block, which me and my wife, we're going to hang door hangers this week on our block, then you can find some door hangers on your way out. Get some door hangers. Get maybe 10 and just hang them on your door. Just leave them there. Let's invite somebody. We love you. If you need prayer, come on up. We love to pray with you. God bless you. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you. God bless you.